couple of minutes. And just a little bit of housekeeping. We do have quite a few people on the call today from coast to coast across Canada. We also have a few people joining us from the U.S., so welcome to everybody. And we will be keeping all of the attendees on mute this morning so that we can maximize an opportunity for some really good audio. As we're going through the webinar, if people would like to, um, we're always welcome to uh, field some questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to chat, put it into the chat box at the bottom of your panel. And we'll either answer those as we go, or if it's a little bit more appropriate to address it to everybody, then we can, we'll also have a discussion period that will be open at the end of the presentation as well. So welcome to those of you who are logging on. People are coming into the room, so we will be getting started in just a minute or so. Okay, we're going to get started because it is 11 a.m. and we do want to respect everybody's time frame this morning and we'll be making every effort to keep the webinar to about 30 or 35 minutes. So welcome to our webinar this morning. My name is Leah Warner. I'm a Corporate Program Director with Employee Wellness Solutions Network and I'll be hosting this morning's webinar which is Building an Effective Wellness Program. Um, again, we will be keeping everybody on mute because because we all of the attendees because we do have quite a few people on the call this morning and if you have questions that you would like addressed please put them into the chat box at the bottom of your panel and we'll either answer those as we go or we'll add those into the end of the presentation where we will have a little uh, discussion period that will be open to questions as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter this morning. Uh, our presenter is Karen Kelly, who is also a Corporate Program Director with Employee Well Solutions Network. And she's been with EWS Network for about six years now. And she has some great information for us this morning about building an effective wellness program with lots of good tips and ideas. So I'll turn it over to you, Karen. Thank you, Leah. Welcome, everyone. I'm really excited today to talk to you about really the importance of corporate wellness programs, where they fit with a lot of your companies, and what programs exist out there, as well as what we feel are, are really the components that make up a successful wellness program. So in just telling you a little bit of the background of EWS Network, we've been around for about 11 years now. We celebrated our 11th anniversary in October and we're now in over 110 locations and in over 60 cities. We have probably over 25 wellness consultants now and we work with many strategic affiliates which are professionals that we choose to work with in the communities we serve. Our average client engagement for on-site programs is over 85 percent which means um, in, in anything that we're doing, whether it's one-on-one -on -one coaching or group programs, um, we have 85% participating in some way. We've been recognized uh, several times with different awards, and most recently we were awarded the Benefits Canada Health and Wellness Program of the Year Award for um, employees, for companies with employees under 1,000. We were also awarded Benefits Canada Engagement Award and we were the finalists for their Communication Award as well as their Strategic Partnership Award. So we're really getting recognized in the wellness industry and that's hugely satisfying for us. For those of you who are really wondering why corporate wellness programs are, are necessary or what the big deal is about them, I thought maybe starting with some Canadian statistics might help you understand what we're facing. It is really quite alarming when you think that 60% of Canadians are either overweight or obese. And when we look at how that impacts the corporation, obese employees are absent on average about 13 times more than non-obese employees and incur 36% higher medical claims costs. 
Moving on down that list, we have 53% of Canadians who are physically inactive. And they're sedentary about nine and a half hours out of the day. And that's out of their waking day. So we really want to take, uh, take control of that and do something about that. It's a really trendy topic right now. We're hearing a lot of the term sitting disease uh, because of the people that are so inactive through the day. Moving down that list, we have 40% of Canadians with high cholesterol. 23% of Canadians are reporting a high degree of life stress. And that's really alarming too. Many of you may have watched some of the Bell Talk um, um, information last night for their mental health day. And this is something that we're becoming really aware of, the, mental the impact of mental health on people and our workplaces. It's really not just a matter of getting over it and, and um, you know, moving on. If we're really not careful and proactive about how we manage our stress and teach people about strategies on, on how to manage that stress, it can lead to mental health issues over time. We also want to look at high blood pressure. 20% of Canadians have high blood pressure, and I've hosted enough biometric screening days um, to really recognize a lot of people don't even recognize they have high blood pressure. 17% of Canadians are still smoking, and last but not least is a, is a problem that seems to be increasing, and that is 8% of Canadians have diabetes, and even more have prediabetes. So you can see that we're facing a lot of um, conditions in our society that, that we really want to help people with. In fact, 75% of healthcare costs are a direct result of unhealthy lifestyles. If we look at obesity, poor eating habits, physical inactivity, and smoking, these are really responsible for the vast majority of health risks that um, that we're seeing, and those risks are really skyrocketing in our in our population. So besides having how a wellness program makes people feel, it's really cutting into the bottom line. And we really feel that if, if we can help reduce those costs, then we're on the right track. And in fact, 50% of healthcare costs relate to dependence, so it also makes sense to take wellness home, take home the information that we can provide so that they can be healthy as a family and work towards their goals that way. And just as a side, those costs, the 75% costs, don't include the direct cost of sick time, retention issues, morale, which is huge, and energy levels of your employees. There is a good news story. I feel like sometimes that's a lot of bad news all at once. But many of those chronic conditions are preventable. 80% um, of type 2 diabetes, 80% of heart disease cases, and 40% of cancers are linked to lifestyle behaviors that can be avoided if we can only educate them and motivate them to move in that direction. So we've got kind of the background there with why a corporate wellness program is so important. Now what is a corporate wellness program? Well, we like to think of them as on-site services. I think the on-site is key for that. And the first thing is to identify the health-related risks in an employee population. And then simply promote and sustain good employee health and encourage them to take those habits home. There are a ton of ways that corporate wellness can be implemented in various companies. It can vary from a very basic lunch and learn every six months, for example, to a real comprehensive program that I'm going to talk to you about today that kind of covers everything in different ways that people learn and different ways that people can become engaged so that you're engaging people in different ways. I think it's finally coming from a place where it used to be considered a perk to now where many companies are recognizing that it does make good business sense. We can see that Canadians are not healthy and they're not getting healthier on their own. So they need some help. And that's where these programs can come into play. It's just, it's just working with people in a really proactive way and helping them lead healthier lifestyles, whether that's to do with their nutrition, whether 
we talk to them about fitness or stress or sleep or their energy levels. There's, there's all kinds of topics that, uh, that we can help them with. So we just want to lead them down that path so that they can lead more productive and happier, healthier lives, both at work and then at home as well. So what is out there? Well, according to the National Buffett Wellness Survey, uh, approximately 72% of companies are offering something. Interesting about that, though, when asked, um, when the employees were asked, only about 23% of employees indicated that they had a wellness program. So not a lot of them knew what was out there. Now, the most popular offerings that are being made, um, first of all, is an EAP program. 72% of companies offer an EAP program. 70% uh, considered a flu shot as, as their wellness program, and, and maybe only their wellness program was the flu shot. A lot of these in the top part of this slide um, I probably wouldn't consider as part of our wellness program, but this is what was listed. First aid and CPR training, employee recognition, ergonomic workstation assessment, time off in lieu of overtime, flexible work programs, staff appreciation events, and now we're getting into sort of the need of a wellness program is a wellness newsletter and nutrition education. The other ones were a little bit further down the list. It seemed that higher impact initiatives that require a greater organizational commitment or, or perhaps money, like some screenings or health risk assessments, were used much less frequently. For example, smoking cessation is, is way down on the list, and yet employers can really reap the benefits of that if they, if they were to do something along that line. But only 36% offered something. Fitness subsidies are offered, blood pressure screening at 30%, and an on-site fitness program at 29%. Only 26% took a strategic approach to improving employee wellness. So what that means to me is that many companies may be taking a stab in the dark at, at what they were um, going to, to run their corporate wellness program on. So maybe they were taking um, the flavor of the month, so maybe this month was cancer month or this month is mental health month, so they were taking those types of topics rather than really looking at what the health risks are in their organization. This slide is on really the, what we've heard and what we believe are the benefits and objectives of a corporate wellness program. So number one, it, it's the right thing to do for employees, but most importantly, it improves the health and wellness of employees. It also really helps to improve the culture of the workplace, and I've certainly seen this firsthand when I think of a lot of the manufacturing companies uh, where people are often divided between office and production people. Bringing them together in a team challenge can really improve their work relationships, which improves the culture of the workplace. Decrease the cost of health benefits is certainly an objective that we work towards. Uh, decrease the short-term uh, disability and long-term disability. Is an objective as well. The retention and attraction of new employees and, and current employees is really important because it costs so much to bring somebody new in. And then marketing. It, it means something to some, of, some younger people and, and a lot of people that come into a company that cares enough about their employees to have a wellness program. As well as winning different awards like a, um, the Waterloo Region Healthy Workplace Award, that says something about the company as well, so it is good marketing for them. Along with the benefits and objectives is certainly taking a look at the return on investment. And there's enough studies out there that show there is a return on investment that we can confidently say that, that, um, that there is a return on investment happening. Wellness programs save about one and a half to 1.7 days in absenteeism per worker over 12 months, which makes out to be about $251 per employee per year in savings. And then Harvard University put out a, a study 
that indicated for every $1 spent on wellness programs, medical costs fell about $3.27, and absenteeism costs fell as well by about $2.73. So this slide I, I really like because it just emphasizes that 20% of employees are generating um, about 80% of the costs, which takes us to the other side. If you look at the other side, saying that 80% of your employees are generating only 20% of the costs. So we want to really focus on the people who are in that left side, the healthy and low risk side, before they move into a high risk side. We find that prevention is the key to this, and we want to keep those healthy people healthy. So before we go on and talk about what we feel is uh, the, the real key components of a good wellness program, I want you just to sit back for a moment and think about your own workplace. So just start to think, is there a place for physical activity? Is it outside or is it inside? Either one is good. Is there a walking trail maybe close by? Or, or have walking routes been outlined so people know where to walk? And if it's a busy road, maybe, maybe some bright colored vests could be provided. Just different things to think about there. We have done fitness classes in extremely small, small spaces, or perhaps desk stretches, you know, all together in a, in a room. Um, so the inside fitness workout area doesn't have to be really big. It doesn't have to be a, a gym. And I think a lot of people discredit any fitness activities if they don't have the gym. Um, next one on the list that I wanted you to think about is just the food that you provide. When a company provides food, what is it? Is it pizza every Friday? And, and is it, you know, sausage and pepperoni pizza? Or is it a thin crust veggie pizza for those people who, who would prefer that? We're not in the business to say, you know, you could never order pizza. But we'd suggest that you offer some alternatives for the people who are watching their waistline or who do want to eat healthier or who might want to do more of a plant-based um, um, eating plan. So taking a look at what you're ordering if you do provide food. Even food for um, you know meetings that you're having in house, um, are donuts available and coffee, or are you offering some yogurt and fruit and, and you know tea perhaps? So there's lots of alternatives out there. And then what is accessible? If your employees are really hungry in the middle of the afternoon, what are your vending machines offering them? And is it only chips and chocolate bars, or could you offer something a little healthier? Next on that list really has to do with stress. How does the company and leadership team approach stress and change management? Do they take into consideration how people manage change and deal with stress? Are there flexible work arrangements? And is there a quiet room maybe that could be used if it's needed? How big is your smoking area? I know a lot of companies pay more attention to their smoking area then maybe setting up a small um, activity area. So taking a look at that, is it easy and inviting and accessible? The next one on that list, do people take breaks throughout the day? Are they encouraged to take breaks or stretch throughout the day? Or are they considered a martyr for working through their lunch and rewarded for that? Are they off the clock when they leave work? or are they expected to check in constantly? And lastly, do you offer any resources for people to get the help they need? So other than EAP, do they have any place to ask questions about their health? And in looking at your employees, many of these questions you may not have any idea, and this is where a, a good health risk assessment would come in handy. How many carry excess weight in their midsection? How many have high cholesterol or high blood pressure? Does heart disease run in their family? Do they exercise a couple times a week? Or do they eat right? Do they have strategies in place to manage their stress? Because everyone has stress. Do they seem to have lots of energy? 
or are they really just present at work and not really doing what they need to be doing? And, and a, a really important question to ask is, do you have an aging workforce? A lot of times this, this impacts productivity, um, and certainly um, being healthy can, can help with that. Okay, so where do we start? We've sort of outlined the components of what we feel are a successful wellness program to get you started. Um, so I'm going to go through each one of these in the, in the next couple of slides. Senior management support is probably one of the most important things to get things started. You have to really have a senior management team that believes in, in what this is all about. First of all, because they can approve the budget that's required for a wellness program. Um, but, but setting out their objectives and what they want to get from it is really important. And they can help with scheduling and department support so that people know that that is part of their role. A wellness committee is also key. Um, depending on the size of the company, that would really determine how many people would be on the wellness committee. But we like to choose people that are from different areas in the company and not all of the fitness buffs. <laughs> so we want to make sure that people are you know, coming from different um, places themselves so they can offer their feedback on what, what sort of things they would need to motivate them and inspire them and what topics they're interested in. So we call them our wellness ambassadors. They're a very valuable source of feedback for us. They can tell us what is working well and what's not. And we tend to meet with them either bi-monthly or quarterly to go over you know, what our past initiatives have been and how well they've been received, and our future initiatives and how we can make those even better. And what we really rely on these ambassadors for is to make sure that other people in the organization know what's going on, to encourage people to sign up for different things, to, you know, to be our team captains on a team challenge and that sort of thing. So a wellness committee or wellness ambassadors are really key to embedding the program into the company culture. I mentioned that um, many companies, 26% to be exact, um, haven't really taken a strategic approach to designing their wellness program. So if you were thinking about putting together a wellness program, these four areas are probably um, some of the key things that you could do. Number one is a health risk assessment. This assessment is really, it's about a, a, hours, is a 38 um, questionnaire, 38 questions um, that employees answer. And in that, they get immediate results that let them know what their real age is. And it also gives them some recommended health actions. So they get a report, so, so that's important, so they know where they can start setting their goals or what they have to work on. What it gives us is a summary of the top five health risks of that organization. So we can use that data to start designing the program. We also um, send out some objective surveys to the management team and the wellness ambassadors just so that we can really start to understand what they're looking for and what they want to get out of the wellness program itself. And then um, once a program is launched and we're starting to do one-on-one -on -one consultations, that's another area that we can look at to make sure that we're, um, if there's a trend or if there's a common topic, we want to make sure that we're looking at that and incorporating it into the program design as well. And then also, um, just looking at uh, drug classifications and health claims and, and your trending for health claims, what your top five drugs are, what absenteeism is, and putting together a matrix that outlines you know, trends from the last couple of years right up to when you start your wellness program can really help you determine what is working well um, and what's not. So putting that together is, uh, is key in analyzing your company as well. So once you've really got the data, you know where your health risks are, and you know um, 
you know, what you would like to design, it's important to try to look at different ways to design your program in ways that are going to engage as many employees as possible. You could have the best program out there or the best top topics and et cetera, but we need to engage people in order to make this work. So we really like to look at it in maybe uh, four different ways that we can engage people or four different ways that people um, learn. And that might be uh, people like to learn in an individual setting. They want one-on-one -on -one attention. People like to learn in a group setting where they can feed off of other people in that group. And people like to just, maybe there's a group of people that just want to look at a poster, or pick up a newsletter, that sort of thing. That would be awareness. Um, and then the last one there is virtual programming. And those are the people that want some information but might not be on site in order to get it. So I'll go through most of those um, in the next slides. The one-on-one -on -one health coaching <clears throat> is probably, probably one of the key things that make up our program. And the way that I like to explain it to people is, wow, your employer is providing you with um, a wellness coach that provides you with you know, fitness advice, nutrition advice, stress and time management um, advice, as well as your own lifestyle coach to put everything together for you at your convenience, at your workplace, all there for you. Typically, there are 30-minute one-on-one confidential appointments. And the desired turnaround time is four to five weeks. So that, that really says to them, this isn't a one-time meeting. This is something that we want to set up for you, that if you want to work on any health goals that you have out there, the wellness coach is going to um, work with you. You'll be accountable there. There's going to be motivation and education and ongoing support for you. So we really had some great results with this one-on-one -on -one health coaching and really feel that behavior modification is the most effective when you're working one-on-one -on -one with someone. And that means there's real sustainable lifestyle changes happening. The second one that I talked about was that group programming. And you could start a you know, group programming in any ways. There is hundreds of lunch and learns that could be, um, that could be done if you wanted to start with that. There's a ton of challenges. Some of the more popular ones I've listed here, pedometer challenges, for example, weight loss programs, work-life balance programs, nutrition at work, stress management. Uh, we have a great one called an extreme lifestyle makeover that outlines, we really start with, with one end of the health spectrum, talking about grocery shopping and menu planning and, um, and meals, um, eating, moving into the fitness realm with strength and cardio training and flexibility and balance and, and all that sort of thing, and then moving into stress issues and, and sleep issues. So really, by the end of the seven or eight weeks, we've really covered everything. And one of my favorite pieces of feedback I got on that program was, you know, the information was fantastic, but what I loved about it was that I've been working with these people for 10 years and didn't get to know them like I did in this program. So you really get to connect with people on an individual basis. Um, another really popular program um, that we have is a lifestyle poker game. And sitting disease, as I mentioned, is a trendy topic as well. But you could also start with inviting outside um, places in like the Heart and Stroke Foundation or the Cancer Society. There are speakers available through those associations that can get the ball rolling. Um, in terms of group exercise programs, we have done um, any kind of group exercise program and a lot of the times it's just a matter of um, introducing the program to them. So maybe doing an eight-week yoga class and then, and then letting them know where they can go to a yoga class in their community. Um, we have muscle toning classes. Um, we tried kickboxing, Zumba step classes. Of course, that's all dependent on the location um, and av availability of space, of course. But walking and running programs just get people moving. 
And our awareness programs, what I mean by that is, is those things that you can just look at, perhaps, like a wellness kiosk, um, or a poster, or a newsletter, or an email campaign, or a recipe campaign. Health fairs, we've also um, included under that, and, and that's, that's a real feel-good day for employees as well. We have these things we call walk-arounds, where we really try to outreach to the people who aren't otherwise engaged in our programs. So what this means is that a consultant will walk around the building or walk around the organization with maybe a little handout like a smoothie or a green tea to take information to people. And what that does is really open up the relationship between them and the other person. And what I found is that over time, once that trust has been established, people just you know, we'll stop and, and ask a question, and that's exactly what we want to get going. So it helps to build the engagement within a wellness program. Some examples of walkabouts that we've done include smoothies, green tea, blood pressure checks, um, desk stretches, stress assessments, um, a serving of almonds just to show them what that looks like with a little handout about why almonds are healthy for you, pH tests, healthy hydration tips, or maybe some snack suggestions. Um, a really key part of our programs as well that I would encourage you to do is evaluate your program on a regular basis. What are the participation rates and what feedback is coming from employees? What's working well? If you're looking at you know, um, those different components that I talked about, are the one-on-ones going over well, the group, you know, what are people liking? And then what benefits are people seeing? And most importantly, is the program that's currently set out moving towards the objectives that were laid out by management, the wellness ambassadors, and what you want to achieve from your wellness program? Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Leah just to see if we have any questions, and then I'll wrap up. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Karen. There were a couple of questions that came through. Um, one was about the health risk assessment. Is it possible to see a sample of your health risk questionnaire? Absolutely. I, I think that's a good idea for you to try. Um, one of the, the ways to get onto that, you can contact anybody that's hooked you up with the webinar, but the email address for that is www.ewsnetwork.com backslash PWP. Okay. And another question that came up when you were talking about evaluation um, and getting management on board. Uh, I'm struggling to get this approved in our budget. Do you have anything to help? Um, we do have a really simple tool um, that helps you ask the right questions and really outlines what things that you should look at to, to look at the trends. For example, you know, looking at your health claim costs over the last three or four years. Um, what have been the top five drug, drugs that have been used repeatedly, um, that sort of thing. So we could send you over a form that you could fill out that will really help outline where your, where your issues are. Um, and we also have a summary sheet I think might come in handy as well. Um, it's a client result sheet that we've seen in, in a couple of different industries that might help your management see the, you know, the effectiveness of a wellness program and the results that we've, we've seen ourselves. Maybe that's something we could send out to everybody who was online this morning just so they can, you know, have that in their back pocket when they need that. Yeah, great idea. Okay. Um, any other questions out there that you'd like to, to bring forward or comments of any kind? Uh, okay, here's one more. Uh, have you ever worked in the automotive industry? Actually, uh, we, we do actually have a company that we're working with um, in the manufacturing. They, they create auto parts, um, but we work in all kinds of sectors, and I think sometimes people think, you know, a wellness program 
is for you know large office settings, for example, and that's not the case. We we do work in office settings like financial settings of insurance and banking, um, but we have a lot of manufacturing um, settings as well. We've worked with unions in the past. We work with a lot of utility companies. We have some companies in the tech industry as well as construction. And um, I know law firms are on our list. I know car dealerships are even on our list. And one that I was most surprised about was a golf um, was a golf course. So we do work in a variety of industries. And the other um, thing to point out there is it doesn't have to be for a really large company. I mean, some of, uh, we have smaller companies that might be 15 people, um, you know, all the way up to our larger companies. So um, I think a wellness program is beneficial for, for any organization. So don't rule yourself out just because you don't think that you fit the norm. Mm -hmm. um, will your presentation be sent out by email afterwards? Um, good question. Um, yeah, absolutely. We can send that out to you if that's something that you would like. Okay. You know, Leah, I just had some closing comments that I, I thought I would include, and that is I just wanted to leave people today with the fact that employees are really receptive to the workplace playing a greater role in their personal health. In fact, I think the expectation is there that their employer will provide education and assistance in supporting healthy habits and education on chronic disease prevention. So it's a great opportunity for employers to act on this. And I think most importantly that by sending them a continuous wellness message, not a, not a once a year wellness message, but a continuous wellness message, sends the message that you care and that message matters to employees. So I'd like to leave them with that thought. That's great. You're, you're absolutely right that that consistency really helps them to understand that they are authentic in that sense of caring. Awesome. OK, thanks for this, Karen, so much. Um, and there was a request for the recording of the webinar as well, so we will do our best to make that available. Um, thanks, Karen. Great presentation, and thanks to all of you who did uh, share your questions, because usually they were floating around in a few other minds as well. Our next webinar is going to be April the 28th and offered a second time on the 30th about how to optimize engagement, and that will be presented by Megan Jansen, who is the co-founder and the CEO of EWS Network. So that will be a great one as well. When you see those webinar invitations uh, go out, they're definitely getting passed around out there, which is great. We welcome all those who are looking for some good information to, to get on board and, um, and join us. So we will leave it there, everybody. Thanks so much for your attendance.